So after lobbying from five different European countries, and in particular from Japan, it seems as though there is some measure of agreement. And it's an interesting one. I'm going to show you why it actually favors EVs a lot more than it sounds like. In fact, if you work this out logically, even though this is meant to be a kind of ban in 2035, it's actually more or less a ban in 2030. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the channel. Welcome to the good news for the weekend. For the freaking weekend, R. Kelly's going to jail and... No, but <laughs> he is, isn't he? I think he is. Anyhow, I've got to say, I do like the guy's music, but heck, it's one nutcase of a person. Getting on to the story here, the European Union, what's happened? Europe will ban petrol and diesel cars from 2035, but with certain concessions. And the internal combustion engine isn't technically dead yet. Pretty close. It's on its last legs. However, synthetic fuels are being recognized as a viable alternative by the European Union. Now, I'm going to tell you why this so-called viable alternative will never be accepted by the general population. And it'll be a huge investment failure and flunk for the companies, BMW and Porsche, that are investing into it. It'll just be a write-off. They'll just say, oh, well, we wrote off a couple of billion this year. What's the big deal? Diesel gate costs us 20 billion. This only costs us two. It's not that big of a deal, fellas. Let's move on. I seriously, I know I sound ridiculous saying that, but if you look at the economics behind synthetic fuels, not even this whole lie of them being green. I mean, that's just frankly insane. And hopefully at some point over the next 13 years before this ban comes into place uh, and synthetic fuels are allowed, they'll just go, ah, Hang on a minute, this is just stupid. What were we, what were we thinking, honestly? But economics-wise, it really is utterly preposterous. If you actually wanted to run your car it, using synthetic fuels, you would literally have to be virtually a billionaire. Let me explain that why, why that is to you in a minute. Now, the European Union has agreed to a new proposal which could mark the end of new petrol and diesel cars, except in some circumstances. Officials from the European Union announced the proposal to introduce a 100% reduction in tailpipe emissions from 2035 on all new cars and vans, encouraging manufacturers to adopt either battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell powertrain technologies. All new cars will need to have reduced tailpipe emissions by 55% by 2030 or 50% for commercial vans. Now, I want to give you some context here. CO2 emissions currently that are allowed in Europe are exceptionally low. They're the lowest in the world. They're even lower than China, where in some places they're extremely low. Now, you can emit more pollution, but you pay a very hefty premium for it. And I'm talking, I mean, look at the billions of dollars that have been given to companies like Tesla in order to avoid, to try and avoid paying these enormous emissions fines. Now, that's based on what? The pretty lax, incredibly lax standards we've had over the last, say, two years, those emissions figures have tightened up every year for about five or six years now in a row, making it harder and harder. I mean, why do you think, for example, Volkswagen, the whole group, tried to con us all into thinking their emissions were something else? Because it's extremely difficult to meet these emission standards. And that was four years ago. Literally four or five years ago. I mean, Volkswagen planned that out seven years ago because they found it incredibly difficult to meet them then. Now, it's even harder to meet them now. Now, imagine trying to go a further 55% in reduction of emissions between now and 2030. Do you know how hard and complex cars will be, internal combustion engine cars will be to manufacture with a 55% reduction over today's 2022 Euro 7 emissions? That will be unbelievably cost prohibitive and unbelievably difficult. Combine that with the estimated extremely high costs of petrol and, right, and the guaranteed decrease in the cost of electric vehicles, significant decrease 
in the cost thanks to what? Well, a number, a number of things. One of them, just economies of scale. I mean, there's no one building EVs en masse, really, other than Tesla. BYD is making quite a few, but really there's no company producing, say, a single model en masse other than Tesla. There's only one that makes, you know, the Model 3 and the Model Y in the large figures, but no one else is make BYD makes lots of different models. There's just the Wuling Hong Wai Mini EV. There's nothing else within the stratosphere, nothing else within. So once we start seeing economies of scale from these companies, once they start building out, once we have terawatt hours of battery production per year, primarily mainly LFP, you've seen the incredible, incredible improvements coming in energy density in lithium iron phosphate batteries, meaning there'll be massive cost reductions in the price of those batteries by 2030. Everyone's saying, right, that electric cars will be cheaper in pretty much every country in the world by 2025. All right. That's what all the forecasts are saying will happen. Now, even if it doesn't happen in 2025, it's almost certain to happen in 2030. Do you think that somehow, magically, internal combustion engine cars with these incredible new restrictions of 55% versus the already extreme restrictions which are causing multiple filters and multiple problems in these cars where they're clogging the filters up and all kinds of issues that they're having with this, Imagine then trying to reduce that by 55%. It's just, it's completely economically unfeasible. It's not going to work. And it's not going to work when you try and compare that with the lower cost of ownership, lower outright cost of buying the vehicle of an internal combustion engine car. So that is why clearly this announcement is more than it seems. It really is, in effect, banning internal combustion engine vehicles economically from being a real possibility in 2030 and beyond. Now, after lobbying from Germany and Italy, along with pressure from G7 member Japan this week, there's gonna be some concessions. Low volume manufacturers will be granted a partial exemption of emissions laws from 2030 after the 55% rule has already been imposed. Car makers responsible for new registrations of between 1,000 and 10,000 cars annually such as Lamborghini, will not have to abide by the 100% tailpipe emissions reduction by 2035. So, I mean, if people still want to buy internal combustion engine vehicles 2035 and beyond, and that's all Lamborghini knows how to do in, in that period of time, which, I mean, I don't see that as being logical, but it may be, who knows, then, yeah, Lambo, they can keep on manufacturing them. But that won't cover companies like Porsche, who clearly make a lot more than 10,000 cars per year. There's not many niche volume manufacturers that are going to exist in 2035 building internal combustion engine vehicles. So it's really barely relevant in my view. Synthetic fuels will be a part of the EU's roadmap for a zero emissions future, despite only one specific reference in the 36-page proposal. While it acknowledged the consultation reflected mixed views regarding synthetic fuels, namely what I've been talking about, which is the tailpipe emissions are real. They do go into humans' lungs. Like, just because we extract carbon from the atmosphere, then we put it into a car, burn it, and create NOx particles, which go into your lungs, which wouldn't have otherwise gone into your lungs. I call that pollution. They don't, somehow. I don't know how they can, <laughs> how this makes any sense. But anyhow, they say this technology is technology neutral, carbon neutral, and will be accompanied by renewable and low carbon fuels for the combustion engine. Synthetic fuels. Let's talk about those for a second. Do they make any sense? Well, they're also known as e-fuels. Nice little marketing slogan there. And they're created by capturing CO2 from the atmosphere and recycling it into hydrocarbon fuels such as petrol, diesel, and gas using renewable energy. Now, the idea is the CO2 emitted from the vehicle's tailpipe when burning synthetic fuels is the same amount that was previously removed from the atmosphere, giving it carbon neutral status. Now, obviously, there's a fair few problems with this concept. I mean, what made all the renewable energy in the first place, right? Carbon made it, right? Are you including that in the equation? Like carbon, we have to use carbon to some degree, right? To make the solar panels, to make the batteries, to make the wind turbines, to make the plants, to make these vehicles, you know, there's, there's carbon involved here, right? We want to keep that to a minimum. But then, you know, taking it, making this carbon and then turning it into fossil fuels, burning it, and then having that all go into everyone's lungs, which does, it does, there's no getting around it, is not, is not, is not, this is not clean at all. Now, 
The other big problem with this is e-fuels are expected to cost around four US dollars per liter. Four US dollars per liter. Now for you Aussies, right now, that's about $6.80 per liter. $6.80 per liter. Now, Porsche Taycan, right, is an incredibly popular car. Porsche had no idea how popular that car was going to be. In many countries around the world, Porsche sells more Taycans than it does, than it does, right, of any other internal combustion engine vehicle. In fact, if you put them all together, all their internal combustion engine sports cars, you put all their sales together, Taycan sells more. That's how popular the thing is, right? So you're saying people are going to go, you know what, I want a slower internal combustion engine e-fuel vehicle, it'll be way slower by 2035. There'll be no way of, the gap will continue to increase in terms of electric car's performance. And obviously, as you can see, very, very tiny marginal gains in internal combustion engine vehicle performance. So they'll be much slower, but they'll be preposterously expensive to run. I mean, six US, six Australian, $6.80 per liter or four US dollars per liter. Now that's what they're hoping for, hoping. That's probably best case scenario. I mean, seriously, in eight years time from now, that cost could be twice that. That's probably best case scenario. I really cannot see that taking up, taking on. And if it does, it's going to be so incredibly niche. It'll represent surely less than 0.01% of the world's vehicle production. So it's really irrelevant. Now, what else happened? Well, the language used in this proposal also allows for the use of hydrogen as a fuel in internal combustion engine vehicles, which is, of course, an alternative fuel being developed by Toyota. Toyota has been working on a hydrogen-powered engine. In fact, they've got a Yamaha engine which runs on hydrogen fuel. It's, um, it's quite interesting. It's, its performance is actually not as good as the internal combustion engine version, and obviously the hydrogen is preposterously expensive. Yeah, I find it all just a bit laughable, to be honest, when you, when you look at the mathematics behind it all. But whatever, you know, if, if they want to have a couple of hydrogen cars getting around, good on them. Now, the recognition comes after German Environment Minister Steffi Lemke told her European counterparts the country would only support the proposal if synthetic fuel-powered vehicles were included, according to an earlier report from Reuters. The move will extend the life of the internal combustion engine for the foreseeable future. However, it's likely to be reserved for use in very, very small market-specific entry-level passenger cars, some commercial vehicles, and very low-volume performance cars. It will be a tiny niche market, which will disappear pretty quickly. I think it'll be very, very similar to the way that um, film, what happened when we got digital cameras. You know, film was, it was kind of that, that period where digital cameras first came out, right? They weren't all that good. They might have been like one megapixel, two megapixel. Then we got to four, then we got to five, then we got to 10. And by then, you know, by the time we got to 10, everyone was like, you've got a film camera? Really? Where do you get the film from? You know, and now, where do you buy the film from? You know, do you see it anywhere anymore? Remember what it used to be hanging up at the supermarket and there was film everywhere? Yeah, it's not there anymore, is it? Well, this is what's going to happen. Same kind of thing. The EU recognized, though, the potential for synthetic petrol and diesel to provide so-called affordable climate neutral mobility, opening the door for internal combustion engine cars to continue to be made and sold in some regions where the full adoption of electric and hydrogen vehicles is not viable due to economic reasons and lagging infrastructure. Earlier this week, reports suggested Portugal, Slovakia, Bulgaria, Romania, and Italy had joined forces to delay the emissions target. However, the inclusion of synthetic fuels in the proposal likely provides a workable pathway for these countries if their citizens are willing to pay four US dollars per litre, four US dollars per litre for fuel or more or a lot more. Yeah, I mean, it'll be more expensive than that if they have to try and make more of the stuff, right? I mean, imagine the situation for people in these countries. There is no way known that since this synthetic fuels option is an economic viability for people in these countries like Portugal, Slovakia, Bulgaria, Romania, or Italy. It's just zero emission vehicles currently include battery electric vehicles, fuel cell, and other hydrogen powered vehicles, and technological innovations are continuing, the EU's proposal reads. Whatever that means, I don't know. Zero and low emission vehicles, which also include well-performing plug-in hybrid vehicles, can continue to play a role in their transition pathway, the transition leading up to 2035, not beyond it. 
It's thought significant pressure from officials representing major car companies, car manufacturing countries, Germany and Japan, are largely responsible for the acknowledgement of synthetic fuels within this proposal. Japan has been a public advocate for hydrogen and hybrid vehicles. Germany has been vocal in its support for synthetic fuels following billions of dollars of investment in the technology by BMW and Porsche. A communique from the leaders of Group of Seven or G7 who met in Germany this week and were joined by leaders of Argentina, India, Indonesia, Senegal, South Africa and Ukraine stopped short of naming specific emissions targets for vehicles. The language used in the document was almost identical to a quote leaked early this week, which allegedly replaced the goal of a 50% tailpipe emissions target reduction by 2030, which would have mirrored the emissions goal announced by the EU overnight. Getting back to my original point here, trying to reduce the emissions of internal combustion engine vehicles by 55% from their incredibly stringent already Euro in-cap levels right now is going to be incredibly problematic for these manufacturers. So one of two things could happen here, right? Manufacturers could try to still keep selling them after 2030, when I think most people won't want them, and in which they have, well, have no choice but to pay fines, right? Or to pay companies like Tesla for tax credits. I'm sure Tesla will say, thank you very much. We'll keep on taking your money for the foreseeable future and invest this into our company. And really, that's actually still happening now, believe it or not. The media doesn't talk about this very much, but still, automakers still cannot meet the current emissions rules in Europe. They can't right now. Imagine them trying to get to an additional 55% reduction on targets that they can't meet today. Please, somebody explain to me how that is going to work for them. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.